1950. Well, I was born in Louisville, but we, my parents lived in Spencer County on Main Street at that time in 1950. So, uh, don't remember much until I was uh, a few years old, but we lived right on Main Street at the bottom of Town Hill. So, my grandmother uh, lived there after her husband had passed away and then we had a house right above her so uh, we lived right here until i was uh, 10 years old and then after that we moved to uh, in the country uh, into the elk creek area now uh, my dad bought a piece of a farm from evan lewis and they were in the my father was in the chicken business at that time so they put some chicken houses up there. We had a feed mill, which was right up the street here at Mill Street. And uh, so we used, we had chickens here in town and we had chickens out there. And then we sold feed to farmers and uh, around here, the community. Cause at that time, Spencer County was one of the top four or five uh, dairy counties in the state of Kentucky, believe it or not. There were so many small dairies that, I, that uh, that was what the town, really, the city was kind of, uh, you know, tobacco and cattle and, uh, and cows, milking cows was what the main economy was at that time. So, but that's uh, how I came to, to know here and went to school here. And then I went away to college. Well, I went to the service before uh, I graduated from high school, actually. Uh, I went into Coast Guard Reserve between my junior and senior year of high school. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, the Vietnam War was going on. And my father had found out that there was a reserve program in a Coast Guard Reserve that I could get in, but I had to go in before I was 18. So I signed up, you know, kind of, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what, anything about Vietnam at the time, really. But um, I, I went in after my junior year of high school and went into service for six months active duty and then I came back and finished up my final year here and at Taylorsville High School. Then I went away to college for a year in Virginia and then I came back and went into the family business here. So that's, I was in here, let's see, I was in, lived in this county until I was 37 years old. So that was 1987. That's how I came to be here. Uh, this being the county seat, it was where everybody, all the uh, farmers from around the neighborhood would come here, especially on court day, which was one day a month, on a Wednesday, I believe. And then the streets would be packed. You couldn't find a place to park. Uh, then, but, and there were just a few restaurants here. I remember, uh, Bean Stewart had a uh, restaurant, and uh, there was a place called the Let's see, the Sweet Shop, and uh, then later on there were a couple of other restaurants as well that I remember. But that about the only entertainment there was was there was a, a movie theater on Main Street, the Valley uh, Valley Theater, and it was run by the Smiths. So. Uh, that and the pool hall were about it. That was the, our big, uh, lively entertainment downtown Taylorsville at the time. Well, actually, I didn't, I was not in Vietnam. I just went in for six months. My father had been a fighter pilot in World War II, <clears throat> and he flew 56 missions over Germany flying a Mustang fighter plane. So he was fortunate enough to get back and 
that's why I'm here. Uh, he didn't make it back. So uh, uh, he didn't want me to have to go to the war unless there was an all-out war. He told me, he says, if you go into the Coast Guard, if there's an all-out war, you're going to be in it, you know. But if not, you know, you can probably go come back, graduate from high school, go on to college, and avoid being in, a, in, in, the, in the military for any length of time. So the reserves at that time, you would go in for six months, uh, basic training, and then I went on to a ship, uh, the Unimac, which is a training ship for the Coast Guard, and stayed on that ship. Uh, we sailed uh, to Bermuda, and then we went to uh, Belém, or Belém, Brazil. So those were two, that's, those are the, about the, Belém's the furthest away I've ever been from home, you know. Uh, we were the first man of warship to be in Brazil since World War II, so. It was interesting, learned a lot, uh, realized how our service people, what they sacrifice, how hard they work, and what they have to deal with a lot uh, to be in the service. So I was really lucky in a way that I got to be in because it was right after that time that uh, the draft that they had changed because the people were upset because none of the senators or representatives, family members, were going into the service. We had several people that went over there that uh, it basically destroyed their lives, you know. They, PTSD, and they didn't really know what PTSD was at that time. You know, it was all you heard then was just, "Well, tough it out, buddy." You know, uh, so it had an impact. But they, their people, had an uproar about that, and they finally were going to have the draft changed to where everybody had a number, so they had a draft lottery. Well, my birthday would have been was 312, I think. So I would have never been drafted and I would have never been in the service. You know, I, I was lucky that I didn't have to go to Vietnam. I hated it for the guys that had to go. Uh, and, uh, but I learned a lot about the sacrifices made. And I won't mention his name, but I'll tell you a story. And he was, he was about the most passive guy I ever knew in high school. Just a great guy, good ball player, played softball, baseball with him in softball. But anyway, I just ran into him Mm, about a year ago and we were talking and he'd gone to Vietnam. He enlisted. He wanted to go. Anyway, he told me he came, he came back into the States. I think he was coming in, I don't know whether he came in San Francisco or San Diego, but someplace in California. And there were guys heckling him coming down the hallway and, and then one of them spit on him. And he proceeded to kick the ball, that guy, in a genital area, and then was beating the hell out of him, and the other guy was with him, took off running, and a policeman came over and got hold of the situation, and he said, now you just need to just go on, get out of here, I understand what went on, because he wasn't taking it. And he was, he was just a, a mild-mannered guy, but, he came back and you know, that was terrible. There were people that went off to serve the country and, you know, it was a war we wish we'd never been in. And, you know, politics is, a, is something that's a, it's a necessary evil in a democracy, but it's pretty tough. And that was one of the decisions that changed a lot of people's lives. So, um, and hopefully we won't have to have any more like that, but it, doesn't, but it does seem like that there always are conflicts and probably always will be. Elk Creek was just, it was just all agricultural. There was, there were just farms, small farms. Some of them might have a hundred acres. Some of them, you know, the largest farms around were maybe three or four hundred acres um, that I knew of, you know, in that area. But there was a lot of dairy people in that area. And matter of fact, that was the center of our business was we had hammer mills. We would come down, load up with feed, take their feed out to the uh, farms grind their corn and put soybean meal and corn, uh, minerals and vitamins things like that in there 
and uh, that was what we did. But we had we would we were in at one time we had two hammer mills. We would grind fifty or sixty batches of peat a day. So there was a lot of dairymen here. Uh, I didn't. I was just a kid, so I don't know all about that. But I've heard a lot of stories about it, you know. And then at that time, our mill was kind of the center of the community. People brought their wheat in. They would store their wheat with us. They'd give us some of the wheat to pay for us storing their wheat for them. And then we'd grind it, and they would get flour through the winter. That was the way things worked back at that time. But there was more. There was not a lot going along, on in Elk Creek at that time. You know, I was. Uh, let's see. I was thinking I was about in the third grade, and that's the first time I rode a bus. You know, because I'd ridden my bike or walked to school when I lived in Taylorsville. But then, and we still came to Taylorsville to go to school. Uh, it wasn't even Spencer County School then. It was Taylorsville High School, and that was the only school in the county. There were, I think, 970 people was the population of Taylorsville about that time. At one time, there was as many as 7,000 people that lived in the county, but it had dwindled some because of people just leaving, uh, and it got down to maybe four or 5,000. And then after the dam came in and the water came in, it, it exploded to what you see today. So we didn't do much in Elk Creek. Uh, we would I come to Taylorsville, ride the bus, go to high, uh, went to grade school and high school there. <clears throat> About the only things to do as far as entertainment were uh, uh, basketball and baseball. I was fortunate enough my father let me play sports. A lot of guys that were more athletic than I was, they're you know they had to raise tobacco. They had to be there in the winter time to help bulk tobacco uh, and. Uh, one of the funny things was everybody would say, well, we got to book tobacco. And so I thought it was B-O-O-K, but it's bulk it because you were putting it in bulk and uh, putting it down so you would keep it moist so you could then strip it. So that was, uh, they had that and there wasn't really uh, that, raising cattle and hay and feeding. It, that was what... That was entertainment if you had it. You know, you might go fishing sometime or go swimming in the pond. Uh, there was a swimming pool in Shelbyville at that time, but there was none in Spencer County. So the bus would go over to take people over swimming in the summertime to Shelbyville for a while. So there weren't any, there wasn't even a VHS at that time, you know. If you were fortunate and you had a TV, you might watch a little bit of TV or listen to the radio. I remember one of the entertaining things that I did in, in, in high school was I would I had a transistor radio and I loved baseball and I'd listen to the and my father would let me take a day off to see the World Series. And but there were days that I had to go to school too and I would take the transistor radio and put it in my pocket and run a little wire up through my shirt and have a little thing in my ear and I could listen to the World Series while I was in class. Nobody knew that until until I told you, but yeah, the Dodgers and the Yankees were big at that time, and uh, I was a big Yankee fan, and uh, it was kind of fun. So, so that was what you did. The sports was about it. We had a ba basketball game in the winter time. We'd have one on Tuesday and one on Friday, and we had a pretty good basketball team when I was playing, and and the gym would be pretty full. That was a big part of entertainment during the winter time, and as basketball is huge in Kentucky so we didn't have a football team we had a basketball team and a baseball team that was it that was all there was at school class I was I was president of the junior class at, at school uh, I don't know why you know maybe nobody else really cared to be that I always said that, and I was I was actually president of the Chamber of Commerce here for a year or two, and I said the only reason I was the president of the Chamber of Commerce is nobody else wanted the job. So, yes, uh huh. My grandfather's brother, Ed Henry, <clears throat> started the mill in either 1906, 7, or 8, something like that. And then my grandfather, Clinton, uh, his br Ed's brother, came in, uh, I don't know how long after Ed had started the mill, but within a year or two. And uh, so they ran the mill together until the, around the Depression time. 
and we were one of the bigger employers in the town. I remember them talking about during the Depression, you know, there wasn't any Social Security at that time, but at that time, uh, during the Depression, we I forget how many workers there were at the mill, but we would grind the flour, the, the wheat, make flour, and we send the flour to eastern Kentucky and bring coal back. Uh, so, but all the people that we had on our payroll at that time, uh, they kept paying them through the depression as long as they could. And at the end of the, at the end of that time, I mean, the mill was just practically bankrupt. I mean, it was, but it, but everybody had a job as long as they could keep them going. And that's what people did back in those days. Now, if you've got social security and all the other things, uh, uh, food stamps and all types of welfare issues that help people that are that are down and out or have had uh, problems and you know which you know, it seems to be working okay maybe not as good as some people would like for it to work and uh, you know it seems like any government program everybody no nothing ever satisfies if you make everybody mad you've done a good job I think well, after I after I went to college I came back here and I worked uh, and I would drive trucks and bring feed in and I'd deliver feed to farmers and then we had a spray a sprayer we had, at that time we were not uh, uh, we weren't let's see we weren't in the chicken business anymore the chicken business had gone kind of it, it had drifted further toward Arkansas it was, you could just it was closer to where the feed was and where the the, the river to take uh, supplies down so Arkansas became the major producer and it was tough to make it in the chicken business. But anyway, I came back and I worked there, you know, making feed and uh, creating, try to create a few mineral packages to put into our grinds and things like that and then spraying crops. So I, I worked there until the mill burned actually. And it, um, after it, it burned in uh, I think it was March the 1st, I don't know, it was kind of all a blur and I don't have all that remembered, but uh, it had snowed about, I don't know, 10 to 13 inches of snow. And uh, we'd had some people that had been stealing some gas from us. And, uh, Larry Lawson had, was a sheriff at the time and he caught him. And uh, anyway, I remember him telling me after we had, you know, he had me come, for some reason, he had me come down to file charges. This was in the middle of the night and in the sheriff's office. And he and I were there and the guys that he was had caught were there too. So, you know, it was kind of not real smart on my part of his either that to, to uh, do that right in front of him. And he told me, he said, you know, you might ought to get some insurance. Well, at that time, it cost about, if you wanted $100,000 worth of insurance, you had to pay like $13,000 a year. And we had an old mill that was built back in 1906 or 7, and the way they built it was with all with wood, and they had two by 12s that would lay, they would lay them flat on top of each other. And those would be the bins, and then they would stagger them so the, the, the wheat would flow out. So it was an old wooden structure. It was the biggest building in in Taylorsville at the time and uh, he called me about I don't know a few weeks later he didn't call me I got called from the fire department and said uh, uh, Marty got some bad news of the mills on fire I said well how bad is it he says it's pretty bad anyway so I remember coming in at three o'clock in the morning coming down the new road and seeing this huge blaze you know probably 150 200 feet in the air it was I'm sure it was the biggest fire at that time in Spencer County, and I hope there's never one any bigger. But yeah, that pretty much stopped production the way it was. We, uh, I decided then, after the fire, that my father, who had been there all his life, outside of when he was in the war, uh, we would we built. A, I had some chicken houses. I had refurbished, poured concrete in. I was going to use them to store your corn, buy your corn and then grind it during the, the winter time for the farmers. And we, it was empty and so we, we made it um, into a little feed operation over there and, 
so Dad could stay there until he retired later on. So, and that building's still up on the other side of where the mill used to be. So uh, uh, he stayed here, and then I, I decided I had two children, and uh, one of them had some special needs, and I knew I had to. And I didn't finish my college degree, so I didn't have a college. You know, I hadn't graduated college, so I had to find a good job. And I was fortunate enough to have a cousin who was a, he was a sales manager for a large used car dealership in Lexington. And so after I sprayed crops that, I told him I'd come to work for him in September, because I sprayed, sprayed tobacco a lot in August. And I said, that's my big, big month. So after I'll do that, I'll come and go to work for you if you'll take me in. He said, well, you've been talking to people and selling vehicles, you know, you're just selling all your life, so the main thing is you just tell them the truth, and if you don't know, you tell them you don't know, and we'll find out. So, anyway, I'm in September, I think it was September the 7th, I went to work for Don Jacobs in Lexington. Well, when I was growing up, yeah, it's changed a lot, there's no doubt about it. When I, when I was growing up, and I don't remember exactly much of the process, because I was little, and uh, but they had uh, they had a, an engine, a two-cylinder engine, I think, in the uh, in the engine room. And the way they did it, because we didn't have a stream for water power, they would use that engine, and it rotated, and it drove some shafts, and the shafts would have belts on it about that wide which are maybe eight, 10 inches wide, and they would go up to other places, and that's the way you'd move the grain. You would have this pulley system where it would dip into the grain and take it all the way up to the top of the mill, and then you'd have a chute that would come over and put it where it would be ground, and uh, that was the way everything was moved. Now you have augers, and uh, I don't know how they do it now, but I think, at one time, my father told me, I think at one time there were a hundred flour mills in the state of Kentucky. It was either a hundred or three hundred. It just doesn't seem like it could be three hundred, but it was one of those numbers. And the last I heard, there were like three. But you know, that's just the way it's all. You're, you either get big or you get out. You know. Right, we did. You know, we produced, uh, we had I guess it was that two-cylinder engine, or we had a one-cylinder that I don't remember, that it used to produce electricity, and I guess this was in the, the 30s, maybe? Uh, but it produced, they had city lights for downtown, and it produced the electricity to run those lights. I'm gonna tell you, yeah, we did, we did, we produced electricity for the lights, and at one time, because there was a railroad here, they used to uh, take broiler chickens, they were and they packed them in ice and they sent them to Boston, I think, on a rail car. So they they got into that for a while. So I mean, I guess they did the things that they needed to do to survive during that time. You know, because actually in the Ed Henry, who was my grandfather's brother, who started the mill. I think during the Depression, he had had you know he was involved. And a lot of people were involved with stocks and. You know, they knew it could go up, but they didn't know how it could go down. And I think he, um, I really, I don't know if you want to put this in there, but I think he took his own life. So there was the only, my grandfather ran it until 1948 when he had a stroke, a series of strokes and died. And then my grandmother ran it. Uh, she ran it a lot, I guess when my father went off to the war, uh, she m might have been involved then, but my grandmother, who, who had a college education, she was she ran the mill for several years. So that's, but we did, we produced electricity, we packed chickens and ice and sent them to Boston. And, uh, you know, I don't know how they got paid for the lights in, in Taylorsville, but they did that too. But most of it was, by the time I got around to being involved in it, uh, I mean, I remember being a little and, and with, they would have the flour mill and they would be packaged in the flour and they packed some in five, 10 pound bags, 25 pound bags. And I remember just as a 
little tot I would run through and they would be getting ready to tie the bag up and I'd just knock it off the scale. So the, I was not much help. Uh, but anyway, that's, we, we produced flour for a long time, then it was cornmeal. And then the only thing we went to the, sent to the mountains after a while was uh, we sent stock feed. So for, they would feed their cattle and they were in print bags. And a lot of times these were pretty print bags that they did instead of burlap bags. And they would send them to uh, Eastern Kentucky. And then a lot of the people there would take those bags and they'd make dresses or curtains or whatever out of that. And they take that stock feed didn't all go just to cattle either. They actually used a lot of that it was probably used to make moonshine. So never, you know, had moonshine a couple of times. I'd rather have a real good bourbon than that. But uh, that's that was part of the history of the mill. I would say we were we were yeah we were um, yeah we were involved in some way not knowingly not that we got anything. We didn't bring back moonshine to sell. We would go down there and drop the the, uh, the feed off, and then we bring back coal because most people burned coal at that time. But yeah, we were. Uh, we weren't, you know, uh, we weren't involved monetarily, but we were involved, I'm sure. You know. I retired, so I didn't have a job to, to really go to at, during COVID. So, but what, uh, how it affected us is uh, my wife, Carolyn, and I, uh, she has two daughters, and one of them is their significant other is uh, has asthma and he's an engineer for a large satellite company so it's pretty technical uh, stuff that he does but they had a uh, townhouse in wash in well actually in uh, I think it was Reston or Sterling Virginia and he worked out of uh, close to uh, the satellite companies were right there in around Washington because a lot of them are connected to the government. We were all scared to death when everything started. And we went to Kingsley's and we, because we knew that my, uh, Carolyn's daughter and her, her, her uh, and, and Garrett were gonna come and live with us. So they came, basically, he, and that's the reason I have good Wi-Fi today, is because he's an engineer and he brought wires in and all types of stuff and before we knew it, he was communicating with uh, people in England and people in, and he did satellite testing from there. And, uh, but we did that to protect them. And Carolyn, I don't know how many meals she cooked, but I mean, it was three meals a day for four people. And they would come every once in a while, they'd have to go back to Washington for, I know Leah's computer broke down and they, you know, it was, it went to, she worked for the Naval Yard, so she, I mean, she wrestled around with that computer. They tried to fix it two or three times. She finally got a new computer this year, okay? That's, I think that was 2019 or 2020. So, I mean, now we finally, it's 2022, she got a new computer. But, uh, so, <clears throat> but anyway, that's how it affected us because we were both retired. Carolyn had worked, uh, for the state for over 20 years and she uh you know we both grew up in the country not too far from here she, I, we went to school together actually we went to school she lived in wilsonville and i lived in elk creek and uh she had been they had they had lived originally in jefferson county uh, close to j town and jefferson town and then uh, they moved out here bought a 300 acre farm in 1965 i think 64, 65, because she she became a freshman at college, at, at high school, and I'd gone away in the eighth grade to military school and come back, and I remember her in our class. She dated a really good friend of mine, and she was, you know, crazy about him. He was a musician. She always liked musicians. And uh, so anyway, you know, off to service and all that, and I guess it was after my 30th high school reunion, I got her name and uh, I thought, you know, 
I'm just, I'm not happy. I, you know, who do I remember that I really, that even, you know, maybe liked me? And I, we had gone to this, uh, to the reunion, and uh, I'd gone to the reunion at Teresa, Teresa Winkler's house, and Kathy Day had a, had a, a list of all the people in the class. And I don't know, I got back to work, I took that back to work, and I went down through it all, and I said, Carolyn, I remember her. And sure enough, I called her. She was divorced, had been divorced for a few years, and we started talking. We talked on the phone for probably, I lived in Lexington. She lived in, in uh, Finchville, and I guess we talked for maybe three or four or five months before I ever I took her to lunch one day. and. I don't know. We've been together ever since. A few ups and downs along the way, but yeah. I made one phone call, and that was it. Yeah, uh-huh. She had dated uh, a friend of mine that lived right, well, Larry Lawson's brother, Glenn, and dated him for years. And, uh, but you know, he went on, he went to the Coast Guard too when I went in about the same time, maybe, maybe just a little bit before I did, and uh, a few months, but uh, Anyway, their relationship went split eventually, and he went one way. I think he's in Tennessee now, and uh, I'm I'm back close to home with Carolyn. I'm happy. You know, it's wonderful. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's about the time I was a president president of the Chamber of Commerce. You know, the road ca came in not really to help Taylorsville, but to help people from Jefferson County get to Taylorsville to put their boats in the water. So with that, and then there were a lot of people that wanted to leave Jefferson County and with uh, the Ford plant being there and GE, there were a lot of people making pretty good money. And so that's what, when I left in 87, I mean, in the next 10 years, the growth here was immense, but this road was what brought everybody here. Yeah, that, that road changed everybody's life here, really. It changed Taylorsville completely, and I think it's been been good for the county. Uh, a lot of development has taken place. I would say, do everything you can to listen to your teachers, and don't be like what Johnny Carr said to our science class when I was a freshman in science class. He said, "You all come in here every day, and you say." I'm going to fight knowledge one more day. I'm just going to fight. I don't want to, you know, and that's what you do. You go there to try to not do anything. If you study hard, you listen, find something that you really like to do, and there will be mentors along the way, if you'll listen, that will help you find the place, the right place for you. You know, I had to stumble along for a long time because I didn't get my degree. And I didn't have something I really wanted to do, so I ended up doing what a lot of people do. You go into family business. And then when something, that fell apart, then it's like you scramble. You don't know what. So, I mean, fortunately, I knew a guy that was had been successful in the car business, and I had a cousin who knew how to sell and took me under his wing, and I was fortunate. It was a very difficult life because... The hours in the car business, I never had a holiday, you know, every 4th of July, every Memorial Day, every, you know, it wasn't even, it, Thanksgiving and Christmas, you could get those days off. New Year's Day, big sale. All those holidays, because everybody else is off so they can come back, you got to be there. And the hours could be really difficult, because they always kept you, you know, just a few, you had to work just a little harder to get to your bonus to make a living, you know, so. That was, it, it required a lot. So find something you like and get your education as far as you can go. And then there'll be help along the way if you'll just listen and ask. And uh, I think the main thing is to be confident enough that you ha will be successful if you do the right things. And even though it might be difficult sometimes to do the right thing, if you do it, you'll, you'll be rewarded for it. I think enjoy your life, work hard at studying because that's the way education is a key to success. And um, the best and brightest people that I know and the most successful ones, even to doctors that have helped my child who was 
we didn't think was going to be able to see. And at one time, he was ahead of uh, North and South America uh, for a, a tech in a technical position after he got his uh, degree. And uh, you know, so we I was go, went from thinking I was going to be raising a, a blind child to having he's probably the most successful or is successful. I have a daughter that's very successful as well, but uh, he's a you know you just never know you know you didn't think it's not going to work stuff you just got to keep keep on pulling keep on working at it but get your education that would be mine